Welcome to the Dragon's Library, your source for games, movies, shows, and more. Hello, everybody! I finally finished Subnautica! I know, I've, been te- I've only been teasing it for like the last month. <laughs> uh, it took me forever to finish that game. Uh, mostly just because I didn't have a lot of time recently. I've been doing a lot of other stuff. Um, and Subnautica's been kind of low on my priority list, so... Uh, but yeah, it's done. I like it. I mean, I, I knew I was going to like it. I've I known that like for a few weeks now. It's a well-put-together game, definitely an improvement over the original. Um, okay, let, let's get started here. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, Subnautica Below Zero is a new underwater, uh, open-world crafting and surviving game, survival game um, that was recently released back at the end of May. Um, I know everyone who heard open-world survival crafting game immediately started groaning because the internet has like 20 of those. But everybody who knows Subnautica knows Subnautica is one of the better games in that genre. Uh, one of the ones that's actually trying to explore new pl- places instead of just trying to beat Minecraft but with better graphics. Which, you know, defeats the point because the whole point was Minecraft's rudimentary graphics made it fun. But whatever. Anyway, um, so for those of you who haven't played the first game or don't play this one at all... You can check out my review for the first game, play that one, play this one, then come back. Um, unless you, you know, don't care about spoilers, there will be those later on. But just so everybody's working on the same basic knowledge, uh, Subnautica is a survival crafting game, which means, you know, you explore, you collect resources, use them to craft new materials, upgrades, and tools in order to exp- expand the amount of area you can explore and craft. Uh, The gimmick of the Subnautica series, because I guess it's the series now, is that it is an underwater survival crafting game. So everything is taking place on an ocean planet up uh, in space because it's all sci-fi. You have like a Star Trek replicator and, you know, uh, fabricator to generate bases and stuff like that. And you start out with like just like basically the equivalent of a scuba suit. You have to use materials you find on the planet to fabricate uh, a new mask and, you know, better oxygen tanks, more, you know, faster flippers, uh, build bases, explore in the water, build submarines and uh, diving suits and go further and further, exploring the remnants of an ancient alien civilization that you found on the planet, that was found on the planet, and slowly uncovering whatever the big mystery or overworking story is for the game. Uh, the first Monica game was literally just, hey, this random guy crashes on the planet, Uh, Let's figure out why it crashed. Turns out it was... uh, Okay, well, spoilers for the first Subnautica game, because I need to explain that game to explain the plot of this game anyway. So, the first Subnautica game was a... First time you encountered the planet, I forget what the exact numeration is, like 3.41, whatever. It's it's just a string of numbers and letters together. So, uh, everybody just calls it Subnautica. Well, I do anyway. Don't know about everybody. So, that was just a random guy he crashed landed on the planet because their spaceship got shot down for getting too close to the quarantine zone. Turns out this entire planet is infected, had an, a massive bacterial infection or a virus or whatever that basically heavily reduced most of the life on the planet. A lot of the fish you encounter in the, in the game, although aren't dead, a lot of them are suffering from advanced stages of infection. Uh, and this all happened like thousands of years ago. So there's this ancient uh, alien empire called the Architects who apparently, or the Precursors, uh, who apparently, you know, the generic alien names, uh, were on the planet and were looking for a cure. And in, in the course of the first game, you find the cure. I'm not going to tell you how because I don't want to fully spoil that game. And it gets distributed across the planet. Um, this basically, you know, cures all the bacteria. And the company you were working for, Altera, uh, you go back to, and by the time of this game, they've established, mil- you know, scientific research bases there to study the precursors, or as we later know in this game, the architects, and find out about their culture, their technology. They have really powerful energy sources called ion cubes. Uh, they have these teleporters and advanced, you know, spaceships and travel they want to unearth. However, um, recently, all, before you get there, all the Altera Corporation pulled out all their suddenly and you know, all of a sudden just pull out all their scientists from the location and left it. It's just a dead planet. Um, The only other person, a human person you're going to find on the planet is a, like, lone survivor kind of person who just is living out there. She's not aligned with Altera and is constantly getting annoyed by them. Um, 
she's actually really cool. She has like this really cool prawn suit with like a blade arm. You encounter her pretty early on. Uh, she's got like a pet like alien uh, Arctic wolf thing, uh, and and she's just a really cool in character. You, she's one, basically one of the first uh, major story beats you're probably going to encounter. So you're there looking for your sister Sam, who. Uh, was one of the Altera researchers and went mysteriously missing and never came back despite Altera pulling out. And they told you nothing about what happened to her, so you're going to go down there and figure out what happened. Um, in the course of uncovering the mystery with her, you find out uh, what Altera was actually looking for on the planet. Bum, bum, bum. An actual living architect. Sort of. Um, and so, you know, you go on this mystery, this journey of discovery, try and find everything. Uh, this is all, like, stuff that happens in, like, the first act, so, you know. Um, anyway, so, what do I think of the gameplay? Gameplay's good. Really solid survival crafting, something Nautica already had, but it refined a lot of the features that in the previous Nautica game. Proved a lot of them, uh, things that were kind of problems. For example, instead of having, like, a Cyclops and a, um... Sea moth, when really you just kind of need the sea moth and the cyclops is loaded for longer explorations. They just created this sea truck thing, which is, hey, you can just add modules to the end of the sea truck and it just becomes the cyclops. Which I thought it's a really cool way. I, I think it works better than the cyclops and sea moth system from the previous game. There are less things you had to store around. Uh, the cyclops was already kind of, always kind of a pain because you could never store it in your base. There was never a docking mechanism for it. So instead of like building one of those, you just build a sea truck and go around with that. Um, there's a lot better crafting. I feel like you had to use a lot more of the resources than the previous game, where most stuff was literally just like titanium and a few side resources. This game has a lot more components uh, that can be crafted from other resources, a lot of new resources to add. Like instead of using coral for, for stuff with the batteries, you use this like sea plant. Um, and I do like that. I like that they're spreading out the resources of it and not having it as centric on a few key resources even to keep mining large chunks of. Now, granted, for the base, you're going to try to get a ton of titanium, but that's like the base resource of the entire game, so I'll let that slide. In addition, I think that the upgrades are a lot less one-sided. Like, I feel... It, it felt like an actual challenge to get all the upgrades and, you know, fully deck out my base and that kind of stuff. I felt like I was actually being challenged with that instead of just going on busy work. I was actually having to search for it. In addition, the... Um, uh, locations you visit are a lot different than the previous game, which I very much am thankful for. The big theme of this one is that you're up in, like, the frozen north, the Arctic, of the Arctic poles of the planet. And they actually fixed my big main complaint in the first game. See, the first game was really good. It had, it had some of the best underwater movement mechanics, you know, it was really good at moving around underwater. And a lot of the gameplay underwater was really fun. However... There were a few times when you had to go on, like, an island or, like, this, you know, rocky mountain ledge and try and go on shore for things. And the walking mechanics just felt really awkward. Like, moving around on the ground felt really awkward. And it felt like there was no threat when you were above ground. Like, the, there were only, like, one or two points in the entire map where you could actually experience enough fall damage to kill you. I literally never died from fall damage in the entirety of the first game. Uh, I didn't die from that in this game either. But it was more of a threat in this game. In addition, there are, I did actually die on land a few times because you could actually die on land now because there are actual threats. There are meters you can check on land. It's not just like a sun free zone where as long as you're eating some, some of the fruit that grows on the island, you're fine. There are actual threats to keep track of and other meters to watch out for. Uh, that's not to say the, the land, the land mechanics are the, are exactly flawless. There were quite a few uh, instances where I'm like, that's a bit buggy, but that makes sense. Uh, the reason most video games, fun fact, the reason most video games have really bad underwater mechanics is because like 95% of the game is spent above water. So, of course, that's where the game developers put most of their efforts. If there's not that much stuff to do underwater, they're not going to refine those mechanics as much because they weren't looking for things to refine. That's why a lot of underwater mechanics are really bad and why that one underwater level is always really, really bad in most games because... They kind of just threw the mechanics in there and didn't really think about them. Because uh, they didn't have to for the entirety of the rest of the game. But Subnautica has the reverse problem, you know? It has most of its mechanics focused underwater, so the mechanics above ground are a bit less uh, thorough. They also add a few new things, like having these little drone robots that you have to go uh, find hidden locations with. In addition, they have uh, some uh, a land vehicle now, the Snow Fox, which is like a hover bike, which is really cool. 
Uh, I do have one minor problem, one of the uh, spoilers for like an enemy later in the game, but when you go to the Arctic Spires later in the game with your hoverbike, you get chased by like this burrowing worm monster. And at first it was really threatening because it kept knocking me on my bike and I couldn't figure out how to get away from it. And then I had to like risk, once it knocked me on my bike, my bike was really damaged, I had to risk taking out the repair tool to try and repair it. And I stood there repairing it, getting ready to try and like hop on the bike and run away when I heard it run at me. But it just kind of stood there and didn't do anything. And I eventually learned that you could just, like, whenever it knocks you off your bike, you can literally just stand there repairing, and it will, it will literally just, like, take a time out <laughs> and just let you repair. And I'm like, okay, someone never gave it an actual, that told it what to do if you were too close. Uh, so it just sits there, and w- which completely took the threat out of what was actually a really stressful part of the game, uh, trying to na- navigate those, you know, big open areas with this giant underground worm monster chasing you. Because now it's, oh, he knocked me off the bike. Let me sit here for a few seconds while I'll repair it back to full. All right, we're good. We can resume the chase. Mm. Oh, he knocked me off again. Repeat on infinitum. Uh, so, you know, might need to work on the bit more there, but it was still fun. Uh, the other parts of the land, the, like, snow bears or snow wolves or whatever you want to think of them as, um, they were really fun. They The snow stalkers, they were really cool. Um, earlier parts of traversing the above ground, the big mechanic you had to look out for above ground is cold, because, you know, it's a frozen wasteland, so you can put on, like, the frozen jacket and stuff like that, but before that, I was trying to, like, run between heat sources, like, you know, steam vents and these, uh, thermal flowers, and trying to, like, get my, you know, heat up. I actually died from the cold twice, because I wasn't able to get that heat up. Um, eventually I managed to get the salad, which is the most broken food item in the game that restores a hundred food, a decent amount of water, and a hundred body heat. It's like, just carry around ten of those and you'll be good. I mean, eat up from your, like, resource, you know, resource base, but, like, who cares? You're basically invincible from, like, you know, above ground and most SAS ailments at that point. You don't have to really worry about your hunger meter, your cold meter, or your water meter. Um, granted, you had to get some of the, um, like, mid to late game plants to do it, so I guess that's fine. Um, all in all, really cool. Some new locales. The underwater ice areas were nice. However, one of the big problems I did run into was trying to find the shore to get back to the place. Like, okay, the main problem is that it's really hard to find things, and unlike in the old game where you were constantly getting beacons and locations... Not everything you go to marks itself as a beacon on your map, so unless you're carrying around a lot of beacons and constantly marking places, which can be a pain in some resource space, you're going to have a hard time finding things, because I've i been to have like, the game just assuming these things were going to pop in my uh, signals, you know, after I got there, like in the first game, and they didn't. Now, granted, there was the island and a few other places in the first game, but for the most part, things marked themselves. And since they didn't... Uh, this one I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out how I get back to somewhere to go grab, like, two resources so I could go back and actually, you know, continue the main quest. But that's the problem with a lot of survival games, and it's just the nature of the genre, so. So, yeah. All right. This is going to be going to story spoilers, because Subnautica actually has a really good spoiler, uh, you know, a good, decent story. Uh, a bit different from the first one. I highly recommend this if you like the first one. I think it's a great game. Definitely one of the better things to come out in 2021. All right. Nobody's here who doesn't want to hear about the story? Okay. So, um, in Subnautica, about a third of the way through the game, you find this uh, ancient alien ruin, well, one of many, and you are contacted by an AI who is actually one of the architects. Um, The architects basically were an alien race that eventually transcended their bodies. They fabricated bodies and transferred their their thoughts into them time after time. So they were basically like cyborg, a cyborg race, full cyborg, fabricated their body, you know, new bodies to live optimally in every environment. Um, and he was hiding from Altera because he didn't want them abusing the architect technology. Uh, eventually you go through like a story of discovery with him. The main character has some actually really nice interactions with them. They play off each other well. She's kind of a stark, snarky scientist, provide like the human voice for us. He plays the, I'm not really sure what all this emotional and music and dancing stuff is, you know, robot character, but he actually has a really good performance with it. I'm, you know, whoever the voice actor was for him did a really good job. Um, and by the end, they kind of have this bond. Uh, one of the side missions you can do is finding out what happened to Sam uh, and you find out that they found a frozen Leviathan with the virus still intact inside of it, and Altera was going to weaponize it, and she stopped them, but it resulted in her death. 
So, you know, we cure it so that nobody can ever abuse its corpse again. Oh, never, never abuse the bacteria again that nearly destroyed, like, an entire civilization and a planet. You know, like, it seems like a bad idea to play with that, but Altera is really... They're, they're Wayland Hutani in space, okay? They're Wayland Hutani in, in all but name. So, I mean, of course they'd want to play around with it. So, yeah. And by the end of it, you end up helping him rebuild his body... So he can take the cure back home to his homeworld, neither ho- hoping that they've either uh, managed to isolate their homeworld from the plague, or um, you know, if not, mourn their deaths and figure out what to do afterwards if he's the last of his kind. Uh, so the main that they you know rebuild his body. He tells this story about how he was the one who found the cure, but in doing so, they had to capture the sea dragon eggs. And when that happened, all his other compatriots were infected and weren't able to upload their consciousness like he was. So although he found the cure, it remained isolated until the previous game's character, you know, released it. And he feels guilty because that might have been the thing that uh, broke containment and let it go back to their homeworld as well. Which, you know, if it it's left ambiguous if his race survived or not. Uh, the ending is she's like, well, I figured out what happened to my sister. I've got nothing left. I'd like to start over and going to, a, you know, an alien homeworld, being the first human to ever go to the architect's homeworld, maybe you know, learn all that they have to teach us. Seems seemed like a pretty good new life to start over with. So her and Alan, who that's the, that's the old uh, robot's name. I mean, not the robot, the architect's name. Sorry. Uh, and they reactivate the warp gate. They get in the ship and they have this really cool sequence where they go through multiple warp gates as they uh, like first into like an asteroid field and then do like, you know, a storm. And then finally they're home. We see the architect's homeworld, the glowing ionic energies pulsing through their buildings. No sign of any other life, but the architects were, you know, scientists and sort of a synthetic, you know, artificial body people. So they might still be there. They're just not around that much. Maybe integrated into more of the technology. And they kind of just leave it on, you know, if they're dead, I will, I will mourn for them. If not, we will rebuild and... Regardless, we found a new life together. And you really get the sense by the end of this that the two of them have, like, bonded over this experience. They have similarities. Both of them are scientists uh, who feel like they've made mistakes in their lives. And those mistakes have cost them those they held dearly. You know, he lost his uh, network, the rest of the the rest of the scientists from the Architect's homeworld who were working on the cure with him. And he feels personally responsible for their deaths. She feels guilty for not being on this expedition with Sam and having lost her. Um, and it's nice seeing the two of them kind of just cope together. Like, they are, there's some really good storytelling in this. And uh, you know what? I'm happy that Subnautica is going that route. Now, granted, Subnautica, as a result of going more of this, like, closing knit story and just, like, the locations they visit, while different from the previous game, do kind of undercate, undercut, like, Subnautica, the first game, we didn't really know the answers to anything that was going on for most of it. And we were contacted by this, you know, ancient telepathic Leviathan and, Alan is a bit more upfront, so the, so instead of like the sort of reverent awe and horror of what could be lurking in the deep, it's more of a, we need to fix this, we need to get back to it. It's more of a conventional story and not like as majestic and ancient. There, there are moments like that, but it doesn't have the same feel as the first game. Like, I remember really, um, vividly in the first game when we finally got down to like the molten core, uh, it was like really deep in the planet's, you know, underwater caverns. And you just saw this molten vein of lava stretched out before you with, like, giant sea dragons swimming in the area around a containment place that you finally went guided to. And it's just like this awe-inspiring of moment of, I'm just this random insect before a infinitely majestic world. This game doesn't really have that as much. There are a few scenes like that, like where we found, like, the giant jellyfish or... Um, you know, the law of the architects, like the architect's final ship thing where they show the warp gate. But it's more of a sense of like a personal story of trying to figure out what happened and fix it. So, yeah. I mean, both of them are good. And I think this is a good improvement. Refined mechanics improved on the story while not trying to hit the same beats, you know, going for something different. A main character is actually a character instead of a blank slate, but it works in this context. You know, both work in their context, but I'm... No, I'm glad. I like this game. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode, and thank you for listening to The Dragon's Library. Please, subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. 
The Dragons Library releases new episodes Tuesday and Friday each week. And you can follow us on Twitter at dragon underscore library two. If you want to suggest an episode topic, my email is in the description below. As always, thank you so much for all your support.